Previously on Tales of the Hunger Games, for the quinquennial quell that occurred this year, pairs of tributes were reaped, but in a special twist, each pair was chained together and forced to fight as one. However, it was not revealed to tributes or even viewers until the games were about to begin, and a chaotic yet exciting opening to the games ensued. The ability of each pair to work together was extremely varied, with some bringing out the best in each other, whilst others brought out the worst. Yet it was the pairing of Glamour and Opal from District 1 that had reached its literal breaking point. As Glamour was drying her clothing, she was apparently unaware that Opal, who was sat behind her, was quietly plotting to kill her. Glamour began to hum a melodic tune to herself, whilst continuing to gaze at the fields that lay to the south, and Opal slowly crept towards her with the knife held firmly in her right hand. Eugenia quickly alerted Ennius as to what was about to happen, which caused him to throw the drink that he had been holding over his shoulder and slide his chair towards the relevant screen as Opal approached. However, the metal chain that connected the girls had become slack, and as Opal walked to within striking distance, the chain clinked against a small rock that was sticking out from the ground, which caused Glamour to jolt around when she heard the sound. Opal quickly thrust the knife towards the side of Glamour's neck, but she pushed off Opal's attacking arm with the strength in both of her own, before slamming Opal's hand against the nearest tree, which caused her to drop the knife. Before Opal could react, Glamour yanked the chain, which made Opal fall on her back and hit her head against the tree. As Opal desperately tried to reach the knife that she had just dropped, Glamour trod on her hand, before grabbing one of her own from her pocket and stabbing it through Opal's throat. As Opal spluttered and coughed out blood, Glamour pulled on the chain and breathed out in frustration, before looking back at Opal with a disappointed expression, and asking, What am I going to do with you? Over the next few minutes, viewers were presented with a rather gruesome show, as Glamour manipulated Opal's body into various angles and hacked away at certain parts, in a way that she was rather remarkably able to remove Opal's belt, before leaving her limp body on the ground. Eugenia and Ennius discussed if Glamour was allowed to do this, and if she had broken one of the fundamental rules of the quell, but as she grabbed the supplies from Opal's pockets and sipped water from the river, a single cannon sounded, and Opal's lone body was collected by the hovercraft, with Eugenia nonchalantly stating that apparently this was allowed. The next half hour went by, and Glamour seemed to enjoy wandering around this burrow of trees without Opal being attached to her. The belt and chain were still placed around Glamour's waist, but fortunately for her, they were not too heavy. She then grabbed all of what were now her supplies, and as the sun began to set, she walked south towards the cornucopia field, before resting on the tree line and spotting the tributes from District 2 beneath the cornucopia. However, she suddenly jumped after hearing a set of screams coming from a valley to her east, followed by a double cannon. Viewers saw that Gila and Walter, from 12, were the first pair of tributes to be attacked by a parliament of owls. Although the owls throughout the arena had so far only caused paranoia by staring at tributes, many of their number had suddenly turned violent towards each other and the nearest tributes, with Gila and Walter becoming their first victims. Glamour smiled as she saw the hovercraft about to collect the bodies, yet within a minute, she was suddenly pecked on the back of her neck. She twisted around and managed to stab the offending owl in the head, which saw it fall to her feet, but just as she was about to continue south, she looked up and noticed the rest of the parliament swooping down towards her. Glamour swore and ran east along the tree line, but she was quickly attacked by another owl. She swung the chain around her waist and managed to hit the cell, but just as she continued running, she tripped on the belt that had belonged to Opal, before falling to the ground as the rest of the parliament swooped in. Glamour desperately slashed around the air with her knife, but she was attacked by more than twice the number of owls that were attacking other tributes, with Enya stating that maybe they thought she was an easier target. Either way, Glamour's screams began to quieten down after a minute had passed. The owls soon lost interest in her after her cannon sounded, and she was swiftly removed by the hovercraft. Meanwhile, Hazel had not reacted to Opal's cannon until Belsa mentioned that it was indeed a single cannon, although Hazel said that it was probably not worth worrying about. They proceeded to talk about their plans for the next day, and if they should move, but they were soon interrupted by the double cannon of Gila and Walter. Hazel was just about to continue the conversation at the point that they had left off, but Belsa suddenly stopped her, and alerted her to a parliament of owls that was flying towards them. Hazel began to worry, and as the owl swooped down towards them, Belsa quickly got up and told Hazel to follow her, which she did after grabbing the tarpaulin. Although Hazel frantically asked Belta what she was planning, 
She replied that the owls might like lizards, and she sprinted with Hazel to the lizard's nest that they had found the previous day. When the owls were within seconds of their position, Balsa muttered sorry, before grabbing some of the lizards and throwing them towards the ground between her and the owls. Surprisingly, the Parliament dived down towards the lizards instead of Hazel and Balsa, whilst Hazel quickly scooped some more lizards in her hand. Balsa pulled the chain and shouted that they needed to run, but fortunately for the lizards, they were able to scurry along the ground and away from the owls, which allowed most of them to escape, whilst also distracting the owls. This gave the girls enough time to run away, until they almost slid down the side of another hill. However, Balsa then looked back to see the owl swooping into the air once more, and appearing to look for another target. Hazel shouted for them to both lie on the ground beneath the tarpaulin, presumably in the hopes that this would stop them from being seen by the owls. Amazingly, this plan worked, and the Parliament soon flew to the north. Just as Hazel asked if it was safe to come out, a single cannon sounded, and Balsa replied, not yet. They remained under this tarpaulin until they noticed that it was becoming dark, at which point they returned to their previous resting spot, where they ate and drank some water, whilst resting in clear exhaustion. Hazel agreed to take the first night watch, and at midnight, Horn of Plenty played once again, with the portraits of Glamour and Opal from 1, Velos and Candelo from 5, Eucalypta and Sandrine from 11, Gila and Malta from 12, and Aoife and Iona from 14 being shown, which left only 8 pairs now remaining. During this time, Dollar and Quartz had remained in the forest, without reacting to either the single or the double cannon that sounded shortly before sunset. Yet as Dollar began to hear the desperate screams of Infra and Batrina from Three, who were fighting off another parliament of owls with several coils of rope, he told Quartz to grab his spear. The boys proceeded to arm themselves, and a parliament of owls did enter the forest, although they were so widely divided as they flew between the densely packed trees that the few who made it to Quartz and Dollar without crashing into a tree were easily killed by the pair, and within minutes, the boys had sat down once again to have something to eat. It was then that Quartz spotted a large sponsor gift coming down through the trees towards them. He quickly opened it to find a large picnic, that he and Dollar passionately consumed until they were full, at which point there was still plenty of food remaining. As they ate, Dollar suggested that they head towards the cornucopia the next day, and try to attack either of the pairs from District 2 if it were possible. Court seemed happy with this plan, but added that they would need to be extremely careful, and potentially turn back at any time. Dollar agreed, and as the fallen were shown, he took the first watch, which allowed Quartz to sleep. Whilst the sun was rising the next morning, Balser awoke Hazel, and they rested together in their shelter beneath the tarpaulin. Over the next hour, they had some food and discussed what the likely strengths and weaknesses were of each of the other remaining pairs. Yet just as Hazel finished talking about Douglas and Bryn from 14, Balsa's eyes widened when she looked to the section of ground above the tarpaulin, before throwing herself towards Hazel as a scythe flew into her shoulder. Balsa shouted with pain, and Hazel screamed in shock as Rory and Sickle from 9 suddenly jumped down from the ground above and landed just feet from them beneath the tarpaulin. Sickle then grabbed the scythe and pulled it from Balsa's shoulder, which caused her to shout out in more pain. Yet just as he was about to stab it at her once again, Hazel kicked Rory in the groin with enough force to make Ennius gasp in second-hand pain. Rory fell to the ground and Sickle was pulled down with him. Hazel then panicked and pulled down the tarpaulin from above, which covered both Rory and Sickle, as Balsa used her uninjured arm to help her. Yet just as Hazel jumped onto Rory, who lay beneath the tarpaulin, Sickle stabbed through the material with the scythe into the back of her hand. Hazel screamed in pain, whilst Rory and Sickle desperately shouted obscenities and tried to fight their way out from under the tarpaulin. However, Balsa managed to grab Sickle's hand with both of her own, before shouting at Hazel to take the scythe from his hand, which she was still holding. Hazel briefly panicked, but then grabbed hold of the scythe from Sickle's grip. As Balsa tried to keep a wriggling Sickle still beneath the tarpaulin, Hazel stabbed through and hit Rory's head, which resulted in the material's green colour turning red. She then crawled over to where Sickle was desperately thrashing around beneath the tarpaulin, before stabbing his heart. As the movement beneath gradually ceased, Balsa painfully gripped onto her shoulder and rolled off the bloody tarpaulin, whilst Hazel burst into tears in what Eugenia described as killer's shock when she noticed the quantity of blood that now covered her hands. The double cannon sounded, and Balsa comforted Hazel by saying that Sickle and Rory were trying to kill them, and that they had no other choice. But as the hovercraft came down to collect the bodies, 
Balsa reminded Hazel that they needed to leave before other tributes came to inspect this area, and Hazel soon came to her senses. As the girls packed up their supplies, including the tarpaulin and the scythe, Enya submitted that he was impressed to see this sort of material being used so effectively. Over the rest of the morning, the girls headed north along the western side of the valley, occasionally resting and looking out for other tributes, until they found a spot near the steep drop overlooking the northwestern river, where they rested in exhaustion. On the other side of the arena, courts awakened Dolla when the sun rose, and they had some more at their picnic, whilst discussing what route they should take to the cornucopia field. After they had gathered their supplies and spears together, they stuck to their plan from the day before, and carefully made their way northwest through the forest and across the hills, before reaching the southeastern edge of the valley. The pair then made their way carefully down the steep hill until they reached the valley below, at which point they headed northwest towards the cornucopia field, until they were able to stand at the southern tree line and spot the tributes from District 2 eating, laughing, and occasionally even singing and dancing beneath the cornucopia. However, when Rory and Sickle's cannon sounded, this merry gathering suddenly ceased and they discussed who this cannon belonged to. As the Hovercraft entered the arena and took the bodies from the western hill, Court suggested that they quickly head west and try to ambush any of the tributes from District 2 that might want to investigate the area where the Hovercraft had been. Dollar wasted no time in agreeing, and the boys ran west along the tree line, and then to the northwest, before hiding within a small borough of trees that was roughly in line with the direction that the District 2 tributes would take from the cornucopia. After a minute, Quartz was proved to be correct, as Nero and Julius agreed to investigate this location, whilst Dina and Nina stayed in the cornucopia to guard their supplies. Dollar excitedly, yet quietly, pointed to Nero and Julius as he saw them running through a field to their left. Quartz asked how Dollar wanted to attack them, and Dollar replied that it could be easiest to follow them to the hill and then throw the spears, one after the other, which would hopefully take at least one of them out. Quartz hesitated, but then said that if this plan failed, they would have to run like hell. They proceeded to follow Nero and Julius to the west, leaving at least one field between them at any time, before reaching the edge of the valley, as the boys from District 2 began to climb the hill. Although they were about 50 metres behind Nero and Julius, Dollar stated that he could possibly hit them, and that it was worth the risk. He then breathed out, took a small run-up, and threw his first spear. Unfortunately for Dollar, it landed just a metre behind Julius' foot, which caused both him and Nero to jolt around, before spotting Dollar and Quartz in the tree line. As Quartz swore in a panic, Julius grabbed the spear, before running down the hill in their direction. However, he appeared to have temporarily forgotten that he was attached to Nero, which resulted in the chain being yanked and Nero being literally swept off his feet. They then both fell down the hill, which caused Nero to bang his head on a rock and be knocked unconscious. The boys came to a stop just 10 metres in front of the tree line where Dollar and Quartz had been hiding, and Julius, who had dropped the spear on his way down the hill, was desperately trying to get up, but with no success. He spotted Dollar and Quartz in front of him and tried to grab a knife from his jacket, but it was too late for him, and Dollar threw the spear straight through his heart. Dollar and Quartz quickly ran over to the spear, which Dollar retrieved, and the pair were clearly pleased to have eliminated some of their strongest competition, but they soon decided to not risk taking on Dina and Nina as well. They therefore walked up the hill to where Julius had dropped the spear, which Quartz grabbed, before heading south down the western side of the valley. After approximately 30 minutes, Dina and Nina appeared to worry about their male district partners, and they headed west towards the bottom of this hill, where Nero was beginning to come to his senses, whilst noticing to his horror that he was unable to move with Julius's body connected to him. The girls soon found Nero, and he explained what happened, but once the girls seemed satisfied that they had received all the relevant information, they each pulled gently on their left earlobes and smiled at each other when they realised that they were both doing this. Nero looked gassed and asked if they were about to kill him. They gave each other a menacing smile, then looked back at Nero, before simultaneously responding, Absolutely, and bringing a knife down into each side of his head. The double cannon sounded, and before Julius and Nero's bodies were removed, Dina and Nina checked their pockets for supplies and headed east, back to the cornucopia, although they failed to notice that Cotton and Synth from Eight, who had been spying on the field from the eastern tree line, had taken some small quantities of knives, food and water. The next few hours went by relatively uneventfully, with Hazel and Balsa tending to their wounds by the northwestern cliff next to the river, whilst Dollar and Quartz headed back to the southeastern forest, 
where they relaxed and ate some more at their picnic, before practising throwing spears. Yet as the afternoon began, a chime was heard, that traditionally preceded an announcement from game maker Fling. All six of the remaining pairs immediately paid attention, to hear game maker Fling congratulating them on reaching the final twelve. However, Eugenia, Ennius, and many capital viewers were left open-mouthed in shock and anticipation, as Game Maker Fling announced that, as a reminder that only one of you will emerge victorious, your partnerships will now be ended. Some of the bears looked at each other in bewilderment, but within seconds, the screen on the small device in the middle of their chains, which had played no function until now, suddenly illuminated, and a countdown from two minutes began. Game Maker Fling then wished that the odds be ever in the tribute's favour, and she ended her announcement. A mixture of reactions ensued, with Dollar and Quartz quickly realising that their chain was about to break, but then agreeing to stay together. As for the tributes from District 7, Hazel immediately panicked that the chain was about to explode, before saying that they needed to remove the chain, but Bowser soon pointed down the hill to the river that lay below, and said that they should put the device into the water and hope that this helped them. As the countdown descended through one minute, the girls very carefully proceeded down this hill, with Balsa often wincing at the pain from her shoulder wound. However, they successfully used the stones that jutted out from the grass as makeshift footholds, and with 20 seconds left on the screen, they finally reached the bottom of the hill, before running into the water and resting at the very side of the river, where the current was weakest and the water was shallowest. They then crouched down as the time had passed five seconds, so that the device was submerged in the water. Meanwhile, Dollar and Quartz had decided to place the centre of their chain into the picnic basket, before ripping off some branches from a nearby tree, which they placed over the basket and used to hold it down, just as the countdown reached to zero. A small detonation was heard from within the basket, and its left side was blown off, but Dollar and Quartz appeared relieved that this explosion had not been more forceful, and within seconds, their chains and belts both became lax and loosened, then fell off their waists and hit the floor. The boys seemed elated to finally be unrestrained, and Quartz quickly walked behind a nearby tree in order to relieve himself, whilst Dollar drank some water, but within a minute, they heard another cannon sound. As for Hazel and Balsa, the detonation of their device had occurred at exactly the same time as all the other pair's devices, and fortunately for them, the water had engulfed most of the explosion's force, which only caused a small gush of water to hit their legs, before their belts fell from their bodies. The girls quickly checked their skin where the belts had been placed. They then embraced each other and appeared glad to have at least survived this detonation. Yet as they made their way back to the bank of the river, they heard the cannon sounding. It was shown to viewers that this belonged to Synth from 8. He and Cotton from 8 had successfully wrapped their device in sheep's wool and therefore avoided injury from the detonation. But as their belts fell from their waists, Cotton quickly grabbed his scythe before slicing it into Synth's neck. Yet to Eugenia's surprise, this was the only pair that had turned upon each other, and all the other pairs, except for Infra and Batrina, both from three, decided to stay together after this event. Furthermore, Aeneas stated that he had expected more tributes to be injured by the detonation of the devices, but apart from Bryn from 14, who had been hit in the arm by some shrapnel, no other casualties occurred. As they rested beneath a tree on the riverbank for the next few minutes, Hazel checked on Balsa's shoulder wound, to see that although it was not healed, it had at least stopped bleeding. Hazel said that they would hopefully be sent bandages or medicine by sponsors, but just as Balsa smiled hopefully, a lizard suddenly fell onto her shoulder from a branch of the tree above, and before she could even react, it bit the skin next to her wound. Balsa immediately yelped in pain, whilst Hazel gasped and knocked the lizard off into the river. Balsa moaned and held her shoulder in agony, but Hazel told her to get up and that they needed to get away from this tree, whilst looking up to see more of this lizard's lounge, who were curiously looking down at the ensuing clamour. Hazel put Balsa's arm around her shoulder, and over the next few minutes, they slowly yet carefully trudged up the hill, towards their earlier resting spot. However, during this time, the camera occasionally showed Balsa's wound, and the flesh inside was already beginning to turn a pale shade of green, as Balsa winced in agony, until they finally reached the top of the hill. Hazel lay Balsa against a rock and told her not to panic as she tried to examine the wound, but it was rapidly worsening, and the light green colour beneath Balsa's skin was spreading along her arm as she began to sweat profusely from her forehead. Hazel appeared to be trying to help Balsa, but due to her lack of medical training, she soon panicked and began to cry, 
whilst begging for sponsors to send something that could help, although nothing arrived. Back in the studio, GameMaker Fling was conducting her daily interview, during which time they spoke about the device detonations. However, when the topic of the lizard bites was discussed, GameMaker Fling mentioned that the lizards were attracted to open wounds, and that their teeth had been coated with a fatal venom, for which there was a form of antidote, but it was not available in the arena or even for sponsors to give to tributes. She then summarised by coining the expression, if you're bit, you're in the sh, but before she could say the rest of the last word, Aeneas interrupted and jokingly reminded her that children were watching. Game Maker Fling humorously apologised, declaring that it was difficult to not become passionate over this topic before returning to the control room. Eugenia said that this meant Belsa and Bryn, whose wounds had been bitten, were incapable of being helped, and Aeneas predicted that their respected partners would soon leave them to die. Yet remarkably, neither Hazel nor Douglas did leave their partners. As the darkness of night set in, Hazel continued to rest with Belsa at the top of the northwestern hill, who through her pain even muttered to Hazel that she should try and win without her. This made Hazel emotional, and she stated that there was no way she would leave Belsa, who managed to let out a weak smile. Soon after, Belsa fell asleep, and intense winds began to flow through the arena, but Hazel continued to keep watch over her whilst using the tarpaulin in order to shelter from the winds, until a cannon sounded a few minutes later. Hazel whipped her head around to Belsa, whose fingers were moving slightly as she slept, and Hazel breathed out a sigh of relief. Viewers witnessed this cannon belong to Bryn, when he and Douglas had tried to climb down the side of the northeastern valley in order to look for a cure for his bite, but due to his rapidly declining health and the force of the winds, Bryn had collapsed down the side of the valley, before knocking his head on a rock and dying. As for Dollar and Quartz, they spent the evening resting in the forest, where the winds were not causing as much discomfort due to the barrier that was formed by the many trees that lay ahead of them. When Bryn's cannon sounded, they theorised who it could belong to, but continued to eat and drink some of their picnic. An hour later, they were sent yet another gift by sponsors, which Quartz happily opened to discover a pair of golden daggers. He and Dollar were clearly elated, and thanked the sky as they practised throwing them against a nearby tree. Once he had tired himself out, Court settled down to sleep and another cannon sounded, which Dollar appeared to ignore. This cannon belonged to Infra, from Three, who had headed to the eastern perimeter, where Aeneas theorised that she was going to try and use the electric current to her advantage. However, Infra appeared to have misjudged the speed and strength of the winds, which were especially intense by the perimeter, and shortly after making her way down the most eastern hill, she was swept off her feet and into the air before hitting the perimeter a few seconds later and being electrocuted to death. Soon after this cannon sounded, the winds dissipated, but Hazel continued to watch over Balsa. Approximately an hour later, Hazel watched the sky as Horn of Plenty played, and the portraits of Nero and Julius, both from two, Infra from three, Synth from eight, Rory and Sickle, both from nine, and Bryn from fourteen were all shown, which left only nine tributes remaining, Dollar and Quartz, both from one, Dina and Nina, both from two, Batrina, from three, Hazel and Balsa, both from seven, Cotton, from eight, and Douglas, from fourteen. As the sun rose the next morning, Hazel started to fall asleep from exhaustion after having not slept over the past night. She occasionally dropped off to sleep before stirring herself awake. But as the intervals between these micro-sleeps shortened, Balsa opened her bloodshot eyes and watched Hazel sleeping, before glancing at the few scraps of food and drink that they still had left. Balsa suddenly appeared to use all her strength to sit herself up, and this made Hazel jump and let out a slight squeal, with Ennius joking that she was probably scared by the putrid olive colour that Balsa's originally dark skin had now turned. Hazel then asked if Balsa felt better, but after clearing her throat and coughing out some lime-coloured spit, Balsa said that Hazel would not win if she had to keep looking after her. Hazel narrowed her eyes as she appeared to understand what Balsa was asking, but just as she began to protest, Balsa picked up the side that they had taken the day before, then handed it towards Hazel. Tears formed in Hazel's eyes as she pleaded with Balsa, stating that there must be a cure, but Balsa interrupted her, correctly stating that if she was going to receive a cure, it would have arrived by now, whilst pointing at the sky. Hazel appeared speechless, but Balsa placed the scythe in Hazel's hand, then nodded at her in a reassuring manner. Balsa proceeded to turn away, and a tear dropped from her eye as she looked to the valley to her east, 
while Hazel looked down at the scythe in despair. Belsa told her that she did not have many friends in District 7, as lots of people thought that she was too serious, but that she had always been taught to be responsible, and that this seemed like the most responsible thing to do. Hazel told Belsa that she was her friend. Belsa let out a very weak smile and said that she knew, before placing her hand behind her towards Hazel, who gripped it tightly. Belsa then said that throughout these games, she had failed to realise how beautiful this arena was, and as she looked off at the rising sun, Hazel slammed the scythe into her neck. A few seconds later, Belsa's cannon sounded, and awoke any other tributes that were still sleeping, which included Dollar, who immediately darted around to check on Quartz, and he was relieved to see that he was still alive and well. As the boys had some food and drink, Dollar speculated what would happen now that there were only eight tributes left from the original 52. Quartz shared some of his own theories, but soon suggested that they leave this forest, as it was far away from where a feast may be held, and would be difficult to navigate if the arena became pitch black, which had happened in several past games. The boys therefore packed up the remains of the picnic, their sleeping bags, spears and daggers, before travelling northwest, until they reached the southeastern edge of the valley, from which they could just about make out the figures of Dina and Nina from two, who were trying to climb on top of the flat roof of the cornucopia. After Balsa's body was collected by the hovercraft, Hazel once again decided to move, and she headed in a southeastern direction. As the sun was at its midday peak in the sky, she reached the same burrow of trees where Glamour had killed Opal in the northern section of the valley. Hazel was still clearly in a state of shock from having killed Balsa, but just as she looked ready to pass out in exhaustion, Game Maker Fling made another announcement. All eight tributes paid attention as she congratulated them for having made it this far, before stating that in one hour, a feast would be held in the cornucopia, and that she planned to give each tribute whatever they most needed. She then wished that the odds be in their favour, before ending the announcement whilst Eugenia was heard to squeal in excitement. Batrina from 3 and Douglas from 14 were the only tributes who chose not to attend the feast, with Batrina remaining on the western valley, whilst Douglas remained by the river on the northern perimeter. Dina and Nina had managed to climb on top of the cornucopia, where they were now lying as flat as possible with their knives at the ready, in order to ensure that they had a decent view of the tree line at the edge of the field, whilst they were also less likely to be seen by approaching tributes. As for Dollar and Quartz, they spent the next hour swiftly travelling north, along the southern half of the valley, whilst Hazel carefully travelled southeast to the cornucopia field, and Cotton from eight slowly crept down the eastern hill. With five minutes to go before the feast platform was due to rise from the ground, these four tributes had made it to the edge of the field, while Stina and Nina quietly whispered to each other that they thought they could see movement on the eastern tree line where Cotton was hiding. After a few tense minutes, the platform suddenly rose, and Cotton wasted no time running in from the east, whilst Dina slid along the roof of the cornucopia to the position that he was due to enter the structure. As Cotton neared the cornucopia, Hazel suddenly ran in from the north, which caused Nina to slide to the north of the structure's roof. Dollar and Quartz were the only other tributes to notice Dina and Nina on top of the cornucopia, but after seeing both Cotton and Hazel running for their feast bags, they tried to use these distractions to their advantage, and ran straight in from the southeast. However, as Cotton was about to run into the east of the cornucopia, Dina quickly jumped down onto him, before twisting around his back as he tried to fight her off. Dina immediately stabbed Cotton in the stomach, but remarkably he was able to throw himself backwards, which clearly knocked the wind out of Dina as she was almost crushed beneath him. Meanwhile, Hazel managed to grab her feast bag from the platform before running north, back the way she had come. Yet just as she was coming out from underneath the cornucopia, Nina jumped down and knocked her to the ground. Dollar and Quartz then ran into the southeastern side of the cornucopia, and as they watched Dina finally stab Cotton in the heart, Quartz shouted that he would grab their feast bag before shouting to Dollar and pointing at Nina, just as Cotton's cannon sounded. Hazel was lightly pierced in the neck by Nina's knife when she jumped from the cornucopia's roof, but Nina was now crouching over her, desperately trying to push her knife into Hazel's throat, whilst Hazel was using all her strength to keep this knife away. Cheers were raging through Snow Square at this pivotal moment in the games, but just when Hazel appeared to have run out of strength, Nina suddenly coughed out blood, and Hazel grimaced as it dripped onto her. But as she pushed Nina off, she looked up to see that Dollar had just thrown his golden dagger into the back of Nina's head. During this time, Dina had still been pinned down by Cotton's body, but she managed to free her arm, and as Quartz grabbed his feast bag, 
she threw a small knife which hit him in the upper back and made him fall to the ground, although he was still conscious and quickly called around to the other side of the platform in order to take cover from whatever else Dina might throw. Dina then used all her strength to push off Cotton's body before looking up to see Dollar throwing the knife into the back of Nina's head. As the cannon sounded, Dina briefly shook in anger before running out behind Dollar. Hazel was desperately trying to get to her feet, but after making eye contact with Dollar, she silently pointed at Dina before scurrying backwards. Dollar then turned around to see that Dina was only meters behind him with another knife in her grip. Hazel ran north with her feast bag as Dollar threw his spear at Dina. She ducked to her right, but it sliced the side of her left arm, which caused blood to spray from this wound. This made her shout in pain and fall to the ground, but she grabbed one of her other knives before eyeing Dollar, who was now weaponless. He darted to the feast platform on his right, where courts had been covering, and as Dina tried to get up, Court shouted that they needed to get out now. Without any further hesitation, Dollar helped Quartz from the ground and they ran to the northwest as Dina threw another knife, although it narrowly missed the pair. As Quartz and Dollar made it past the tree line, Dina collapsed in pain and held her wound. A minute later, she looked on in annoyance as the bodies of Cotton and Nina were retrieved by the hovercraft. Meanwhile, Hazel ran north through the valley, whilst Quartz and Dollar continued in a northeastern direction for almost half an hour until Quartz insisted that they rested in a nearby burrow of trees. Dina rested within the cornucopia and opened her feast bag to discover two sets of armour, one of which she placed on her body, whilst the other she simply lay on the ground. Rather strangely, she left the feast bags for districts 3, 8 and 14 without opening them. Eugenia asked why she might do this, but Ennius simply replied that his niece did not need them to win. Dollar checked the pair's feast bag to find that they had also received two sets of armour, before spending the next few hours tending to Quartz's back wound, Unfortunately for him, the knife had not hit any major nerve or artery. As it began to get dark, the pair were even sent two more sponsor gifts, a healing pad for Quartz's wound and another pair of golden daggers. As for Hazel, she continued walking north until she reached the northern river, at which point she finally checked her feast bag to find some bread and a bottle of water inside. She quickly ate some of the bread and drank some water as she looked at the river. Hazel finally felt the wound on her neck, but she seemed worried by the trickle of blood that dripped from it when she touched it. She appeared to be in deep thought as she breathed out, until she heard a voice from behind saying, Hello? Hazel twisted around and grabbed her scythe to see Douglas from 14 standing a few metres behind her, with a pack of bandages in one hand and an axe in the other. She shuddered and got to her feet, but Douglas quickly reassured her, before apologising and saying that he did not mean to startle her. Hazel vehemently shouted at Douglas to get away, as she continued to hold the scythe out in front of her, and surprisingly, he took a few steps back, then calmly said that he was not trying to attack her. Eugenia and Ennius seemed bewildered to see such a calm exchange occurring between tributes at this point in the games, yet they were even more shocked when Douglas slowly placed his axe on the ground. He then stated that by doing this, he wished to show Hazel that he did not mean her any harm, and that he would like to make a trade with her, but that he would be assured if Hazel put her weapon on the ground as well. However, she stared intently at Douglas whilst continuing to hold her scythe straight in front of her. She asked what he wanted, and he said that the wound on Hazel's neck could easily become infected by one of the lizards, and that he would give her one of his bandages if he could have some of her bread and water. Hazel quickly eyed her wound and appeared to realise that Douglas had made a good point, especially after what had happened to Balsa. He even proceeded to pull out the empty pockets from his trousers, then open his jacket and show that he had no weapons, but for repeating that he did not wish to cause Hazel any harm, but that he was starving and thirsty. Remarkably, Hazel began to lower her scythe to the ground, but when Douglas approached, she shouted at him to stop and wait where he was. He did as he was asked, before holding out the bandages and saying that they could exchange them at the same time. Hazel told him to wait, and poured some of the water into her old bottle, before breaking some of the bread, all whilst eyeing Douglas very carefully. But he continued to remain still, whilst Eugenia said that this seemed too civilised so far. Douglas then counted to three, and he and Hazel threw the supplies to each other, which they quickly grabbed, as Hazel still eyed Douglas very intently. He munched some of the bread, before smiling at Hazel, then thanking her and wishing that someone called God be with her. He picked up his axe, and walked back the way he had come, but after a few seconds, Hazel told him to wait. Douglas did as Hazel asked and she stated that she did not even know his name. 
He replied that it was Douglas, before asking Hazel her name. Douglas appeared to be about to approach, to shake Hazel's hand, but she quickly readied her scythe, and Douglas apologised that he had forgotten where they were. Hazel let out an ironic smile, and agreed that it was indeed easy to forget. As it began to get dark, the pair remained several metres from each other, but had a surprisingly informative conversation about their lives before the games. Hazel briefly removed the bandage from her wound, and Douglas said that it looked better, even from where he was sitting. Yet after almost an hour, a cannon suddenly sounded, and they appeared to be brought back to the reality of the games. Douglas picked up his axe and said to Hazel that it had been nice to talk to her, but that he needed to go before it became completely dark. As he gathered his remaining supplies, Hazel asked him why he had not killed her when he approached earlier. Douglas simply grinned, and stated that he was glad he had not, as it would have been no way to treat a bonny lass, before nodding and turning, which caused sympathetic sounds in Snow Square. Hazel let out a weak smile as Douglas disappeared into a nearby burrow of trees, before wiping away a tear. The earlier cannon was shown to belong to Batrina, after she had been found, chased and killed by Dina upon the eastern hill of the valley. Dina then returned to the cornucopia, whilst Hazel remained by the northern river, and Douglas continued into a small forest that was still close to Hazel. Dollar and Quartz rested on the northwestern valley, and as Dollar watched over a sleeping Quartz, Horn of Plenty played, and the portraits of Nina from two, Batrina from three, Balsa from seven, and Cotton from eight were shown. Dina, Hazel, and Douglas appeared barely capable of sleeping that night, and so when the sun rose the next morning, they simply readied their weapons and supplies. Hazel and Douglas remained in their previous resting spots, whilst Dina travelled north, presumably in search of other tributes, until she had almost reached the small forest where Douglas was resting. However, a strong wind suddenly began to roll in from the north of the arena, with even more intensity than the wind that had been witnessed on the third day. Hazel soon fled south, avoiding the burrow of trees that she had seen Douglas enter the previous evening, but she coincidentally proceeded south into the forest where he was now resting. This forest formed a rectangular shape, of approximately 50 metres in length and 20 metres in width, and was indeed less affected by the wind, due to the thick density of trees that lay within. However, the earlier winds had caused a small number of this forest's trees to fall into each other or become uprooted from the ground, with small holes formed where these roots had grown. From their vantage point on the northwest hill, Dollar and Quartz had been watching over the north end of the valley, and they spotted Hazel as she travelled south towards this forest, before deciding to target her. Yet as they made their way down the hill, Hazel spotted them, and so she ran even faster towards the northern end of the forest. Dina had also been approaching this forest, probably in order to escape from the strong winds. As Dollar and Quartz made their way into the valley, they also spotted her in the distance, and Dollar suggested following her instead due to her being a bigger threat than Hazel, which Ennius proudly stated to be accurate. As the boys approached the southwestern end of the forest, it became obvious that the showdown was imminently approaching, and the crowds in Snow Square began to cheer loudly for whichever of the final five they were supporting. Hazel slowly headed south through the forest, darting through trees and occasionally looking to her west, in the direction that she presumably thought that Dollar and Quartz would be heading from. A few minutes passed, and after not having seen either of them, she appeared to panic, before spotting a fallen tree that lay just ahead of her. Hazel quickly approached it, and seemed somewhat relieved to see the ripped out roots and earth in the hole that had been left. She scurried into this hole, before pulling the roots over her body, and rubbing her hands and face with the brown earth, which left her rather convincingly camouflaged within the tree's roots. At that moment, Dina ran straight into the southwestern corner of the forest, but unlike Hazel, she did not appear to know that Dollar and Quartz were also heading towards the forest. A few seconds later, Douglas heard Dina jumping in shock and swearing loudly as a lizard ran across her foot, only ten metres to the south of his position. Douglas quickly gathered his supplies and axe, then crept to the north away from Dina. Yet once he finally stopped moving, he was unknowingly stood just a few metres to the south of where Hazel was hiding. Although the rest of her body was surprisingly well hidden, Hazel's eyes were seen to open with fear as she heard someone approaching, before slamming them shut again. After Hazel heard Douglas's steps coming to a stop, she timidly opened her eyes, but appeared slightly sad to see that it was Douglas in front of her. He was now hidden behind a tree and looking to the south, presumably for Dina, even though he was clearly unaware that an armed opponent was hidden just metres behind him. Meanwhile, Dina had been unaware of how close she was to Douglas, but as she looked out beyond the forest to her west, 
she appeared to spot Dollar and Court slowly approaching her position, and so she carefully, yet rapidly, made her way through the trees to the north of the forest, before hiding behind a tree that incidentally lay only ten metres southwest to where Douglas was also hiding. Even Ennius said that if Douglas had moved just one tree to his right and looked out from behind it, he would have likely seen Dina standing there and looking away from him. Yet just as Ennius was finishing this sentence, Eugenia silenced him as the camera showed Hazel slowly making her way out from beneath the roots of the fallen tree. Due to the winds that were still blowing through the forest, it appeared that Douglas did not hear Hazel creeping towards him, and he therefore continued to look to the south for any sign of another approaching tribute. Yet just as Hazel appeared ready to swing her scythe towards Douglas's neck, his expression seemed to change, and he suddenly jolted around. Douglas managed to block Hazel's swipe with his left hand, which proceeded to become impaled. He shouted in pain, and punched Hazel in the face with his right hand, which knocked her to the ground, but with the scythe still in her grip. Douglas readied his axe, and brought it down to where Hazel lay, but she dodged her head to the right, which caused the axe to chop off some of her hair instead. However, she then sliced Douglas's left heel with the scythe, which caused him to yelp out in even more pain. His foot gave way, and he dropped his axe as he collapsed to the ground. Hazel then climbed on top of Douglas as he desperately tried to push her and her scythe away, but he was clearly now in too much pain to put up a decent fight. Hazel apologised to Douglas and stabbed the scythe down into his neck. Within seconds of his cannon sounding, the wind suddenly ceased and the forest was plunged into an eerie silence. Seconds later, Hazel heard footsteps darting through the trees towards her, which viewers could see belonged to Dina. Hazel quickly dropped her scythe and yanked the axe from Douglas's body. She then ran behind a tree to her east and hid herself, before breathing deeply and closing her eyes. Seconds later, she was seen to hear Dina approaching Douglas's body on the other side of the tree. Dina was clearly bewildered by the presence of a large wound in Douglas's neck, along with the bloodied side that lay next to him, but as she held her knife at the ready, she appeared to be trying to understand if the wound was self-inflicted or not. Yet both Dina and Hazel were then suddenly distracted by the sound of another cannon. Meanwhile, after entering the forest, Dollar held Quartz back and said that they should wait. The boys held out their daggers and looked around at all angles for the next minute, until a cannon finally sounded. They looked at each other, and Quartz mouthed, Who? to Dollar, but he received no reply. The wind ceased, but as Quartz looked ahead, Dollar looked down at his dagger, then back at Quartz. Dollar suddenly lunged his dagger towards Quartz's neck, but Quartz noticed Dollar approaching at the final moment, and he held up his own dagger in defence, which allowed him to deflect Dollar's attack and push him back. Quartz snarled at Dollar and the boys circled each other intently as they brandished their daggers. Quartz said in an annoyed tone that Dollar could have given him a fair fight, but Dollar replied that it was nothing personal. As the boys continued to circle each other, their mutual eye contact did not stop, and Dollar swiped at the air in front of him several times, possibly in an effort to make Quartz jump back. Yet after the third swipe, Quartz appeared to call Dollar's bluff by running straight towards him. The cheering viewers in Snow Square and even Dollar seemed surprised by this sudden attack, and he was hit in the jaw by Quartz's dagger, then knocked to the ground. But just as Quartz was about to jump onto him, Dollar launched his knife towards Quartz's head. As it hit Quartz's forehead, he fell to the ground, on top of Dollar, who quickly pushed him off. Dollar apologised before stabbing the dagger into Quartz's head again, and his cannon sounded. Dollar then grabbed Quartz's other dagger, and after seconds of tensely waiting, he heard the shouts of Dina and Hazel coming from the north. After Quartz's cannon sounded, Dina had looked around and was clearly trying to understand who this cannon belonged to, while several capital citizens, including Ennius, shouted at her to look behind the tree where Hazel was hiding. Yet whilst Dina's attention was distracted, Hazel slowly came out from behind the tree and threw her axe. Dina had been facing in the opposite direction at the time, and although Hazel was not an expert axe thrower, she managed to hit Dina in the upper back, which caused her to fall forwards. However, due to Dina's body armour, the axe failed to pierce her skin or cause any injury, and instead simply fell roughly a metre to her right. Hazel proceeded to charge towards Dina, who was now lying on the floor. She rapidly turned over and took out a knife from her pocket, before throwing it at Hazel. Although Hazel almost dodged this knife, it still clipped the side of her stomach, and she fell forwards, almost on top of Dina, who was about to grab another knife. However, Hazel surprisingly mustered the strength to dive ahead and onto Dina, who was desperately trying to ready her second knife. Dina managed to take the knife from her jacket, but Hazel proceeded to grab Dina's arm and stop her from stabbing forwards. 
The girls were locked in a relatively even battle of strength as Dina tried to force the knife up into Hazel's chest, whilst Hazel was using all her strength to keep this knife away, but she then appeared to notice the axe that lay just a metre to her right. Just when Dina had almost managed to push the knife into Hazel's chest, Hazel suddenly bashed her head down against Dina's. Dina grabbed onto her nose in pain as Hazel scrambled to her right to grab the axe. Dina then shouted and threw the knife, but it flew past Hazel, missing her by mere inches. Hazel yanked the axe and swiveled it round to the side, which resulted in it hitting Dina across the neck. Yet as Dina's cannon sounded a few seconds later, Hazel heard a branch cracking to her south, which viewers could see on the split screen to be caused by Dollar. He looked down in annoyance as this branch cracked beneath his foot, but he slowly continued onwards, with each dagger at the ready. During this time, Hazel pulled the axe from Dina's head, whilst looking around in desperation, apparently unsure about where she should head, before running and hiding behind a tree that lay metres to the northeast. Within a minute, Dollar reached Dina's body, which he carefully examined, along with the trees around him, one of which Hazel was hiding behind. She could be seen hearing Dollar approach, and she gripped the axe tightly, before jumping out from behind the tree, and for a split second, the pair glared at each other. As Dollar braced himself for this final fight, Hazel roared and threw the axe, which hit Dollar's chest, but unbeknownst to her, he was wearing body armour, which resulted in him only stumbling back slightly as the axe fell to the ground. Hazel looked on in horror and swore, as Dollar grinned and readied his dagger. He threw it towards Hazel, but she screamed and darted behind the nearest tree, which allowed her to narrowly avoid the dagger. However, Dollar chased Hazel, and within less than half a minute, he caught up with her, before throwing the dagger into her back, which knocked her to the ground. Hazel screamed as she fell, and she even tried to get to her feet at this point, but Dollar kicked her back down, then removed the knife from her back. Hazel desperately tried to push Dollar away, but he gave her a sympathetic smile, before plunging the knife into her neck. Dollar then leaned Hazel against a tree, as the life left her body. He crawled backwards and leaned against another tree. Hazel soon slumped forwards and her cannon sounded. Dollar let out a weak smile and closed his eyes, before letting out what Eugenia described as relieved breathing. Game Maker Fling announced that Dollar Crusoe of District 1 was the victor of the 95th Hunger Games, and within a minute, he had been airlifted to safety. The price of tickets for admission to Dollar's Victor interview was the highest on record at the time, with many capital citizens, especially young ladies, wishing for even a sneak peek of this handsome, charismatic and cunning young man. For the occasion, Dollar was dressed in a dazzling scarlet waistcoat and matching trousers that showed off his muscular arms and chest to their full extent. Eugenia, on the other hand, wore a dress made almost entirely of metal chains, which strongly resembled those that had been used to connect the tributes for most of the games. Dollar further charmed the capital by speaking favourably of his fellow competitors, including Hazel, Dina, and especially Quartz, the latter of whom Dollar said that he had not at all enjoyed killing, but that he had no choice other than to do so. Dollar's mentor, Mirai, was also brought on towards the end of the interview, and she briefly spoke about the work that she had been conducting in the Kobayashi Self-Defence Centre, and how being a victor had improved her life within the last year. Eugenia commended Mirai for being the first person to train a victor in their first year as a mentor, which garnered applause from the audience. Eugenia also mentioned that this was the first time that a district had won two games in a row since the reclamation, with the last time occurring 43 years prior, which was also achieved by District 1. Before the evening ended, game maker Artulia Fling had her final interview. As Artulia came to the stage, she received a standing ovation and long applause that lasted for almost a minute as she smiled and waved to the crowd. Once the applause had finally ended, Artulia and Eugenia discussed her best moments as game maker, including her favourite arenas, hazards and kills. Artulia mentioned that although she loved the job, it was the right time to go, and that she thought it was fitting to start and end with a quell. A montage of Artulia's best game making moments was also played, and she let out a few tears, but received even more applause as her interview ended. The next week, Dollar returned to District 1, where he used most of the prize fund to restore his family's diamond mines, and allow his parents to retire. In the following years, he also went on to be the mentor to the male tributes of District 1, which allowed him to form a strong bond with Mirai. Historical records indicate that Dollar spent most of the next decade in the capital, where his presence was noted at many parties and celebrations. He allegedly had an array of capital mistresses as well, including Eugenia Ravenstill and Petunia Fling. It is known that after the 100th Games, 
Dollar married and had at least one child, but the exact records of this time have since become misplaced. It is therefore unknown who Dollar's wife and children even were, with many modern historians strongly debating the details of his life to this day. So there you have it, the end of the 95th games. I hope you enjoyed. Now, as promised, I'm going to be doing the Q&A. So, first of all, lots of people have been asking about the tributes from District 7 in the 90th games who were withdrawn after they accidentally witnessed each other. Um, it's pretty much been answered in this, but for anyone in doubt, I, I think we both know what happened to them. Now, next question. Sam Downey asks, if you were a training staff, what section would you be in? I can't really imagine them giving me a weapon or allowing me around live electronics. Uh, fabric station could be fun. Um, I could imagine myself also handing out refreshments to the tributes, um, checking how everyone is, that sort of thing, the human resources person, and uh, maybe spreading a few rumours around, throwing a bit of shade between, get the drama moving for the games, that's probably what I'd do. Next question is Anya Trenkwalder, or Trenkwalder, sorry for mispronunciation. If you were attributed in the games, what would you do for your training assessment and what do you believe your score would be? Um, first of all, I can't imagine my score being brilliant. I uh, might throw a few knives around, um, or I might just try and not do very well and pull a Joanna. See what happens. Uh, I can't imagine it being brilliant though, but I wouldn't want to be a massive top scorer. If I, even if I were somehow capable of doing that. Uh, next question is Conor Mahon, or Conor Mahon, sorry, my pronoun mispronouncing that. Uh, what arena do you think you would survive the best in? Hmm. Something that isn't cold for a start, because uh, I get cold very easily, even though I'm English, but there you go. Um, something urban, maybe. Uh, Empire State Building, the abandoned mannequin factory, abandoned town. Uh, something where there's lots of hiding places, uh, I'd love to sneak out on people. Um, somewhere where I could be a bit crafty, that sort of thing. Next question is Jose Carlos Gayoso Galliano, who asks, How old were Rubia Stolton and Alicia Heath when they won? Hello, darling. I'm joined by Cleopatra here. Um, they are the only victors I don't know their age. So, I would say... First of all, uh, they are 18 years old. Sorry, I got a bit distracted then. Uh, they're 18 years old. Um, every tribute from District 2 who's been in the game since the Reclamation has been 18, and the vast majority have been from the Dalton Elite, who are selected when they're 18 to be put in the reaping to, in the reaping games for District 2. Um, darling, darling, come on! Oh, she's found her new leads. Um, Yes, they're the only ones you might not know, and they're from District 2. Um, next one is Cheerful Satanists asks, I really want to do some art, specifically, and this is weird, but the outfits, especially that Eugenia wears after each day, whatever she thinks is the most iconic, where would be the best place to submit those? First of all, I don't think that's weird at all. I would love to see some art and various people's interpretations of um, some of the images that have been produced in the games. I would say the Reddit... Um, if you haven't checked it out already, it's in the description. That would be a good place to put some, uh, put any art that you produce. Uh, also, anything else that's related to the series uh, is a great place to put things there. And um, if though you're interested in starting your own blog or Tumblr or anything like that, um, feel free to let me know. I've actually just seen a neighbor we don't like go by. Um, Feel, uh, where was I? Oh yes, uh, feel free to let me know and I can advertise it in the next video if you like. Next question is, darling he's gone now. Daniel McKee asks, what was your favourite games to write? Um, I've got several I would say. Uh, the Capital Games, um, working out different hazard for each sector, that was fun. Um, Tiffany's Games as well, that seems to be a fan favourite as well. Um, the quells I always enjoy, because it sort of changed things up a bit. I even enjoyed the 74th, uh, just doing it from a different angle, um, from the viewer's angle. I enjoy all of them, there's different things I like about each. Um, even this one that I've just done, and uh, last one, last 
last year, last week with Lauren. That was fun um, to mix our two different writing styles together as well. Um, hope that answers your question. Uh, Gabby Nicole 018 or 018 asks: In more recent games, you'll tend to focus on two to four tributes. Are there any regret killing earlier, killing off earlier on? Uh, yes, sometimes. Uh, first of all, I know going into each game that I'm going to get rid of at least one, or sometimes even two, because it's almost impossible to have four decent storylines going on for at least a day in the games. Um, I would say Lizbetta from 84. She was a girl from District 10 um, in the games that Estelle won. And Pasifo from 93. Uh, that was the one that Sandy won, his, her district partner. Um, those are two that I think maybe could have got a bit more out of. E even Hawthorne and Rowan in the one we just had. Although I think there's no way they would have lasted very long into the games. But um, yeah, every now and then I do have one where I think, oh, if only I'd kept my life at this moment. But regret is a fool's game. Uh, next one. Vala Cohen asks, cat or dog? Dog. I do like cats, but I do prefer dogs. They're more loyal, even though my one is currently tearing around the kitchen. But uh, dogs will be dogs. Uh, next, Seren Side asks, do you get Starbucks? If so, what's your order? Um, I sometimes get Starbucks when it's open and when we're not in lockdown. Um, I quite like the lemonade though, the icy things like that. I really don't like coffee, which lots of people find strange, but I just don't. Um, so I just got a tiny bit distracted then dealing with my doggy. Uh, next question is Mackenzie May who asks, what other fandoms are you a part of? Like what other movies, TV shows, books, etc. would you say that you're a big fan of? Um, I am a big fan of lots of TV shows. I watch quite a bit of TV. Uh, ones I'd say I'm a big fan of, maybe Drag Race, Black Mirror, Unforgotten is probably, and lots of other murder TV shows. Although I'd say season two of Unforgotten is probably my favourite crime season of all time. Uh, American Horror Story I enjoy. Cult is my favourite season, although lots of people seem to disagree. Inside Number Nine I love Hunted, Stranger Things, Killing Eve, Pose, Raised by Wolves, and oh, any quiz show really. I do enjoy a good quiz show and try and take part in them. And um, so that I hope that answers your question. Uh, next question, Seb Forrester asks, Speaker Drag Race, who's your favourite queen on season 13? I'm loving Rosé. Uh, I do like her as well. I'm enjoying her and Denali a lot. I think they're getting robbed quite a bit. I like uh, Gottmik as well, Utica, uh, Simone. Um, I'm glad that we're starting to be able to get to see a bit more of some of the others, except for, well, I think you know who I'm talking about. It's good that it's starting to be a bit more spread over. Um, I have it down in my head that Gottmik will win. I don't know why, that's just a feeling I'm getting. See if I'm right, I might be really wrong about that, but we'll see. <clears throat> uh, Tuva Applegren asks, how's your Swedish going? It's really fun that someone enjoys my language. By the way, love your work, thank you very much. Tronen svenska talanda till en annan. Tack så mycket, det går bra. Jo lära det på Duolingo. Min hund är jobbig. Cleopatra, kom hit, kom hit. De Garbratak. And my accent there was probably atrocious, sorry. Um, next one, Lelo Lemon asks, what's your favourite animal? Dogs, usually. I uh, like gorillas, I like chickens as well. We used to have chickens when I was young, we used to put them on the swing for a bit of fun. Next question, Murphologist asks, what's your favourite war crime or crime in general? Mine's arson. Um, I've never really tried arson and I don't really do many crimes as it goes. Um, we set fire once to a UKIP sign in our garden, uh, if that counts. Um, haven't really done any other crimes though, to be honest. I've accidentally shoplifted a few times, but that's where my crime spree ends, I'm afraid, um, in answer to that question. Next one is Billy Riddick, who asks, Offal Offal juice. Orange juice or apple juice? Um, apple juice, I'd say. Um, well, the orange juice is okay, but uh, lots of people have the bits in, which I really don't like. Uh, and finally, Freya Gindisgaard asks, do you support LGBTQ+. Yes, I do. I am gay myself, so I support all of those letters, yes. And um, as a matter of fact, actually, I recently found my, the first ever souvenir I bought for a Pride in Birmingham 2010, which is my Pride flag. Oh, I'm supposed to do that with a bit more of a flourish. Um, but yes, I recently found this, so when I saw that question for the q and I thought I'd bring this down. So, thank you very much for joining me once again, and I will not be back next Monday, but the Monday after that.
the 22nd. I hope that you are well wherever you are and that you have a great few weeks. See you soon. Cheerio.